In this video, I'm going to be looking at the Fitzwilliam Hi-Fi Tuner. It comes from a British company called Majority. The decision to review this particular unit was prompted by an email that I received last September from a chap called Phil. He would bought one of these for himself and thought that I might be interested in them too. With this device, you can receive three varieties of radio broadcast, DAB, FM and Internet. And then on top of that, it's also a Bluetooth audio receiver. It's compatible with Spotify Connect. It'll play digital music files off a USB drive or from a network share. And for all this functionality, I paid just £64.95. Unfortunately, no sooner had I bought mine than it went out of stock and I was waiting for more stock to come back in before I started putting a video together. There's no point in reviewing something people can't buy. And then a version 2 turned up, so it looks much the same as mine. It's only available in a black finish though. However, I've now got the version that you can't buy anymore. But anyway, let's carry on. So this majority firm, they've only been around for a few years. They're based in Cambridge in the UK and all the products are named after things to do with that city. Of course, the manufacturing of the devices is being done elsewhere and the products are only sold online through stores like Amazon and their range of devices, primarily radios, is available in a number of other European countries. Opening up the rather flimsy box to have a look inside, there's a proper instruction booklet in here that's all in English. Press pause to read the specs page from there. There was also a three-year warranty card. There was a sheet explaining how to download the instructions in German. And there's also a leaflet about Spotify, which is really part instructional and part advertisement for Spotify. There's one audio cable as well, which is RCA to 3.5mm stereo mini jack, and there's two antennas. And in the foam in the side of the box, that's where the DC power adapter, the remote and the batteries were located. So the first thing to do is to attach those two aerials to the rear of the unit, and then we'll see what other connectors are on here. So starting from left to right, we've got the barrel plug power socket that draws 5.9 volts to amps. Then there's the Wi-Fi antenna, which we've just put on and the stereo RCA line level output. If you'd rather use a three and a half millimeter output, there's one of those on here as well. And you'll see that's next to an input. That's something that you can select from the list of sources on the machine. It might come in useful. Say you wanted to uh, plug a CD player into this and you were going to then plug the whole thing into some powered speakers. To the right of that, you can see we've got digital outputs, both optical and coax, and then there's a socket for a network cable, the telescopic antenna for DAB and FM reception, and the antenna for the Bluetooth. The remote control's pleasant enough to use. It looks a little bit like it's made out of metal, but it is all plastic with a brushed finish. It's got rubber buttons on here that cover all the features of the device. Now, moving back to the front, we've got a USB port, a three and a half millimeter headphone output. The navigation wheel there rotates freely in either direction, and then you click it in to make selections. The rest of the buttons cover the usual controls that you'd expect, and then there's the volume on the right hand side, which also acts as a power toggle when it's pushed. And then on the far right, that's the infrared receiver for the remote. So time to plug it in. Now on the first boot, you are greeted with some welcome messages and a quick setup procedure that asks you whether you want the time to update from the network or from the radio. And then you can also connect it up to your own network if required. It was all very easy to do, foolproof and worked first time. So now I'll connect it up to some powered speakers and we'll have a look at the features. Starting with the FM radio, if you're using the remote control, you can scan up and down through the frequencies, but you can't directly type in a frequency number. If you're using the wheel on the front of the machine, you can't scan through the frequencies automatically, but you can dial them in. If there's radio text, it'll display on the small screen as well. Not really much you can say about FM, so we'll move on to the next thing, digital audio broadcasting, DAB. Now, to get to the next mode, you have to cycle through them. I'd have preferred a direct button for each one. You can also pick them from a menu as well, though. Now, DAB on this works well, but you may know from my previous videos that DAB in the UK is variable in quality, to say the least. But you can't blame that on the receiver. It picks up what's being broadcast and it picks up all the stations I'd expect it to and they all sound as good as I'd expect them to as well. Now, internet radio is always something that I've been meaning to look into more. There's just so many stations to cover every possible interest and often at far better quality than DAB. 
The big problem for me with internet radio, though, is that there's just so much choice. I mean, it's not a bad problem to have, but it's the discovery of the stations that I've always found a little bit difficult trying to find which ones are the best. The job isn't made any easier on the device itself by the small size of the screen. So it's something that's best done online. And if you do set up the appropriate Nuvola smart radio account, you can manage your favourites there online and then it'll sync those with the radio. If you're trying to navigate the internet radio stations purely on the device itself, it can get a little bit frustrating because the screen can only fit approximately 25 characters from one side to the other, and some of the radio station names are quite long, and the important bit is at the end. So you wait for the text to scroll across, and it goes really slowly, and I couldn't find any way to speed that up, and it actually times itself out if you're on that screen. It'll go back to show what's currently playing. So in the end, you click OK to go into the radio station, hoping that will then tell you what that particular station broadcasts. And the name at the top of there is moving incredibly slowly as well. So in this case, it's broadcasting the best of the 60s, but it does take its sweet time in confirming that. And I'd forget trying to find podcasts on this device. For example, I thought I'd look for This Week in Tech. I thought it would be on here somewhere. So Oddly enough, even though the keys on the remote control have letters listed above the numbers, I haven't found any way that you could use those letters in any part of this for typing them out. You've got to use the on-screen keyboard to type things. So this next section, I've sped up four times to show how laborious it is trying to find anything from a long list. And I haven't found a way to jump a page at a time on this, so you've got to scroll one line at a time. When you finally scroll down far enough to find the thing you wanted, it does work fine. There's no problem with it. And there is something that goes quite a way towards rescuing the situation of slow and difficult navigation. And that's presets, lots of presets. You can have 40 for the FM radio, 40 for the DAB and 40 for the internet radio. So when you find something you like, add it in as a preset and you'll save yourself a heck of a lot of time in the future. I should have mentioned the FM presets just show the frequencies while the DAB ones display the station names. Moving on now to the music player, you'll notice here also that the clock is showing on the device. It does that when it's in standby. But to test the music playback of files, I put a USB stick in that was full of tracks. It has to be formatted as FAT or FAT32. And while the device is happy to play MP3, AAC, Wave and FLAC, I noticed that it tops out at a certain point. It won't play my high-res FLAC files. I've got plenty more old MP3s saved on a NAS, but you can see if I was going to use this machine with these regularly, I'd need to reorganize my files into something that had smaller groups so that they were easier to access because this is just one long folder at the moment. This is my old iTunes folder I just dragged onto the NAS to test this functionality out. So as it is, scrolling through this massive list of albums one at a time does take forever, but when you get to one, it'll play fine. And if the artwork is embedded in an MP3, it'll also display that on the screen. And it's quick enough at playing the next selected track as well. Of course, all this no doubt depends upon your network. I am using this wirelessly though, so it seems to be working fine for me. Now, moving on to the next feature, Spotify Connect. This is something that I've never tried before. I'm not a Spotify subscriber, but it works as well as I'd expect it to. I selected the majority as the playback device in the smartphone app for Spotify, and then the selected track playback on the device with the artwork showing on the screen. And talking of that screen, I do feel that the image and the text go too close to the sides of the screen. They just need to be brought in a couple of pixels from the edge, a bit of a board around them. As it is, it looks like things are getting cut off. Perhaps that's something that they fixed on version two. I just don't know. The scrolling text is also a bit weird, as you can see here, especially on the artist name, which is showing in a two or three character box bit by bit just above the progress bar. A quick mention of the Bluetooth receiver mode, which works fine, albeit with a slightly cryptic and less than useful display. And then we've got two alarms, which let you wake up to any of the radio presets or a buzzer. And of course this has a snooze option as well. And then on top of that, we've got a sleep timer. And then finally the equalizer, which lets you pick from a number of different presets or set your own levels of bass and treble. Oh, and here's what it looks like when it's on a hi-fi shelf. So with all these features, you'd think that this is something that I'd be recommending, especially for £65. But as I mentioned, the reason I've held this review back is that they discontinued it as soon as I bought one. 
The arrow shows when Amazon stopped stocking it in September last year, but then version 2 showed up in mid-October, but I thought I'll wait a few weeks just to see if they start selling one with the silver finish again before I make my video. However, this is what happened. While the version 2 started out at a reasonable £75, the price went up and up and well now it's up to a hundred and twenty five pounds where it stops nobody knows but at the moment that's almost double what i paid for mine and you know what it's not all that i mean there are things i'm prepared to live with for 65 pound that i'm not as enthusiastic about at 125 pounds for example you might remember i mentioned that the cardboard box it came in was flimsy and you might have thought well why is that relevant well i think it could go some way towards explaining how my machine got bent yeah at some point before it was delivered the whole thing's got slightly twisted so now it just does doesn't sit flat. But then again, for £65 I'm prepared to stick a piece of paper under one of the feet. For £125 I'd be sending it back. Similarly, when it comes to the rudimentary navigation, I'm far less prepared to live with that if I've been paying double. Of course, when you think about it in isolation, you're getting a lot of features for £125, but nobody likes being on the receiving end of a 92% price increase. But then again, looking on the positive side, if a price has gone up by that much, perhaps it could also come down in the future. I don't know, but if you're interested, there'll be Amazon affiliated links in the video description text box. But that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.